Hi everyone, welcome to Oham, thank you for coming. Um, we're very happy to have our guest speaker here today, Imran bin Tajuddin. Imran is assistant professor at the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore, and his research surrounds the architectural and urban histories of Southeast Asia and the politics of urban heritage and histori historiography. Imran will be speaking on the topic of Malay Buddhist religious architecture and cultural forms along the Straits of Malacca and their translation in mosques and Islamic funerary art. From the 5th to 13th century, a number of Buddhist complexes were built in various sites in Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula. Through a comparative look at motifs and architectural forms in different sites within the Malay-speaking Straits region, and their neighbors. This special presentation by Imran discusses whether it is possible to speak of Malay forms of Buddhist architecture and culture and examines their echoes and traces into the period of Islamic conversions, particularly in mosques and funerary arts. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Imran. Thanks, Rebecca, and thank you everyone for uh, coming to the talk this afternoon. Let me get my bearings. Okay, okay um, let me check a few things. Yes, this works. Okay, um, let me begin uh, by firstly um, introducing you to the overall uh, journey of this talk today, which I hope to uh, finish in about one and a half hours. Uh, it is quite a, I mean, I've chosen to scope it quite widely. Some of you might have been present when I spoke at the uh, Hong, um, suddenly I forget the name, uh, Jalan Atap building, uh, when I was invited by uh, the University of Malaya's visual arts uh, program and um, the Malaysia Design Archive to give a similar talk. Um, and this is a kind of reprisal of it, but I will today emphasize a little bit more on the aspect of translation um, and its signal in the title. Uh, whereas previously I emphasized a little, a little bit more the idea of uh, straits, Malayu uh, Buddhist architecture and culture. And uh, during my previous talk, I emphasized a little bit more uh, the connection between, or not, not so much the architectural connections, but the cultural connections and the, syn the, the synchronic resonances the, uh, in terms of chronology between what has been viewed rather separately, old Singapura of the 14th century, uh, the Kedah ruins, as well as different sites on uh, Sumatra. So if I showed you this image, I was at that time also lamenting the fact that in terms of the visibility and the presence of mind for most of us when we speak about Malay culture, history, civilization, you can call it whatever, you can qualify it with any term. Uh, these images are absent in, our, in that imagination. When we say Malay, we would not associate Malayness or Malay history, material culture, with what I'm showing here. <clears throat> but in fact, um, these are related in some way or another to different Malay polities or Malay-speaking polities uh, across the Straits region. However, the photos here I show you are heavily um, biased, if you like, towards Sumatran examples, uh, whereas there's only one artifact uh, representing Singapore, if you take Singapore as a separate entity, uh, that's the Singapore stone, and over there, I don't know whether you can recognize it, that's actually the uh, finial of uh, many uh, traditional tiered pyramidal hip roof mosque across the region, actually, but this example comes from Malacca. To be precise, that's the Pengkalan Rama Mosque in Malacca town. But uh, it's just a, a kind of show of, of the kind of, uh, I suppose, uh, loss in memory, which, of course, is intriguing to me uh, to observe in the sense of uh, Latif Mohidin's project of, of recovering that through this use of the term Pago Pago. Although, of course, his reference was when he was in Berlin, and I mean, you can read about that, that's, that's quite well known. But here I'm trying to point back to this uh, Buddhist period in Malay history. Just a quick run through, most of what I'm presenting is in some way or another. Uh, with reference to what I've uh, published before, but for very different uh, uh, scopes uh, and uh, a very different ambit. Uh, but uh, I mean, in case you were wondering uh, where you could read up uh, or find out or pursue some question a little bit more. I'm pre dividing my presentation today into four parts. Uh, the first part, uh, we'll look at accounts and testimonies uh, in relation to 
you know, this whole connection between Malay agency uh, and the, the Buddhist milieu, which existed across Asia, actually. Uh, and, and this is another one of my, if you can call that, gripe. Uh, it's, a, it's a lament. Uh, when, uh, the, because of the amnesia, we look at this period of Malay history in terms of foreign influence, quote-unquote. Uh, we talk about it as Indianization, for example. Now, nobody presumes to say this when we look at Angkor Wat. We call that Khmer civilization. We don't seem to talk about it as Indianization of the Khmer, uh, primarily because the Khmer remain Buddhist today. Um, but in the case of the Malays, it seems, and, and also we forget Sumatra. Most of the time in Malaysia, when we speak about Malayness, we think of the peninsula, and therefore we look at Qatar. But if you were to look at the long history of Malay shipping and the language, uh, as well as the accounts uh, that we can uh, refer to about this region of the Straits, both Sumatra and the peninsula, then we find all sorts of references from the first millennium, I mean, if you're looking at the Gregorian calendar. So then you have all of these references to uh, Malay polities with different names, some of which we no longer recognize uh, in popular memory today. Srivijaya, for example. I mean, it was uh, forgotten as a term until it was rediscovered uh, uh, in the 1920s. Um, and so uh, by Sades. So I uh, just uh, brought up three out of many others that could be cited. Uh, but I think what is often forgotten is the connection to the Malay language of this period. For example, V. Nadarajan's wonderful book about Old Kedah, some of you might know the book, actually thought and wrote that this is in Sanskrit. This is the Talaga Batu inscription uh, from Palembang. It is from the 7th century. It, has, it bears no date, but there are a number of other inscriptions around Palembang and elsewhere in southern Sumatra that have, have dates, and they all come from uh, the, seventh, the late 7th century. So we can safely say this is the 7th century. Uh, but I think this, this, the slippage of Veena Darajan is quite instructive to me, that he thinks that this is Sanskrit. Well, of course, it contains a lot of Sanskrit words. But if we were to go through line by line, the sentences, and if you only knew Sanskrit, you would make neither head nor tail of what the inscription is telling you, because the whole thing is written in Old Malay. On the other hand, if you knew Malay and know how to, oh, tat, what, what is this word? Nyur or Eldas Nyur, for example, you would know what it's talking about. I will show you a few examples later, but that's the extent to which this amnesia or this forgetting uh, is pervasive. Uh, and this is something that, of course, is from the 7th century, uh, and this is the, if it's 980, we're talking about the 10th century, um, found in Luzon Island near Manila, Laguna Dibai, actually. And this singular piece of evidence, we don't have any other inscriptions in the area, unfortunately. There's just this one very tantalizing uh, evidence. It's written in a mixture of, just like this inscription from Palembang in the 7th century, a mixture of Sanskrit with Old Malay, but it also contains certain elements that can be pointed to as Old Tagalog, as well as Old Javanese. And so it seems to point to what, by the 18th century, is a well-known fact, that Malay was a lingua franca in the region. I mentioned earlier that if you knew Malay and you knew how to kind of maybe transcribe, uh, transliter not transliterate, but to translate in a way, not translate, it's the same language, to make sense of what is written in Old Malay. This is Naik. It's still in modern Malay. Naik. D is still, of course, in modern Malay. Sambau is somewhat lost. Sambau is the Old Malay word, sometimes spelled Sambo, to refer to ships. And Mangalap is also more or less gone in modern day Malay, but you can say it's something like Menuju or Menggarap, probably you can say in modern Malay. Sidayatra. So here, if you look at this whole sentence, the only non Malay word is Sidayatra. This is Sanskrit. Yeah? The rest is all in Malay. Tapunta is an obsolete honorific. Today we will have something dang here, like a da. Pu would be mpu. Yeah? Uh, in Malay, it's less well known, but if you know uh, uh, cham as well as bugis honorifics, the, the honorific pu or po is quite well known. Nta is the same nta that we have in ayanda, ibunda, nenda, that nda at the back. It's obsolete, dapunta. It, we don't even we don't understand this anymore. It's like empunta, but there's no empunta anymore. Yeah, it's obsolete. 
But that's the extent to which, I mean, we just looked at like, the form, oh, this is very Indian. Well, if you knew Indic languages only, you wouldn't be able to read it. That's what I'm saying. It is in Old Malay, just like Jawi, if you knew Arabic, you wouldn't be able to read it. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to understand what is written in Jawi because the language is Malay. So this is something uh, below as well. Look at that. Mamava. What is Mamava? Membawa. Bringing. Yang Vala. Vala, of course, is uh, Sanskrit. Huh? Dua Laksha. Now, this is an interesting form of the hybrid. So Dua is two. Of course, Laksha is Sanskrit. So 200,000. 200, Dengan. Yeah? And then there's a bit of a obliteration here. Dengan jalan seribu telu ratus. Telu is Javanese. Tiga. Telu. So if you look at this earlier description, that this, sorry, this particular inscription here is with old Javanese, then you could say this has old Javanese too. Telu. Tiga. We don't use telu in Malay anymore. Telu ratus. Tiga ratus. Sepuluh dua. Banyaknya. Banyaknya is Malay. Yeah? So I'm just giving you a taste of this. And I mentioned Sambao is an obsolete Malay word in Old Javanese. Also, there's Sambo in Malagasy, where the Malays and Javanese migrated to. Or rather, Malagasy is related only to the languages of the Barito here. So that means the conjecture here from the linguistic point of view is the Malagasy were related to peoples of uh, this part of bo coastal Borneo. Uh, it seems to have been borrowed into Khmer and Siamese to mean ocean-going ship. And also, this old Malay term Wang Kang, or Bangka, you have the island Bangka, and then you have the town Bangka Hulu, right? It's quite interesting, you know how Sumatra seems to use this term Bangka and Bangka Hulu. I wonder if Bangka Island is Bangka Hilero, because there's a Bangka Hulu. But this term Bangka for ship and Polynesian cognate Waka is borrowed into Old Mon, the Mon, of course, from here. Varavati is their, the name of their old kingdom. And first millennium Tamil texts to mean ships. So this is one instance of a Pramudia would call this like Arus Balik, right? The, the, the flow back towards uh, South Asia, in this case, the use of a Malay term for ships entering first millennium uh, Tamil texts. And uh, the spread of inscriptions bearing Old Malay, I showed you this one, there's Laguna Dibai one. The script spread of inscriptions written in Old Malay include several sites on Java. Actually, there are, here you can only see uh, four depicted. Actually, there are altogether seven. There is a wonderful article. Uh, uh, on this, on all the old se seven old Malay uh, inscriptions found on Java uh, and other inscriptions referring to the Malay polity, Sirijaya, uh, located, uh, spread across the region uh, in Nalanda as well as in Nagapatinam. Um, and and I, I, if I'm not wrong, this should be Tamralipti um, and in Kantan as well. So that's the spread of this uh, largely forgotten. Now, when I say forgotten, I have to add a caveat. Later, we will talk about how this is not entirely forgotten in Malay memory, that it is in fact found, references to it is found in the Sulala to Saltin, and not in the way we are normally accustomed to talking about it. In a very specific, precise, and surprising way, how the Sulala to Saltin remembers Srivijaya. Yeah, but the polities are called Sriwijaya, based at Palembang, and Malayu, based at Jambi. That's as far as the consensus is concerned. Uh, however, there are many references talking about how one Maharaja, either resident here or here, controls several different port cities or port towns along the Straits region. Uh, one reference looks at 11 such uh, port towns. That's the I Ching account. I Ching, the Chinese uh, Buddhist pilgrim, mentioned there were 11 controlled uh, uh, by uh, the king based somewhere in Srivijaya. So I mentioned earlier, Ma'anyan is the language that is related to Malagasa, uh, Madagascar, Malagasi. And actually, there's another enigma I just want to talk about which connects Buddhism in the older Malay civilization with shipping. Because the implication language on those inscriptions that we saw earlier from Palembang it was called language B when it was not yet identified. When uh, it was finally identified, this language B was discovered to be closely related to what we would understand to be Malagasy. Like it's a form, oh sorry, the Old Ma'anyan, sorry. So Old Ma'anyan, which is the ancestor of uh, Malagasy, or the cognate of Malagasy, uh, was the language used at the top half of these imprecatory prefaces to the inscription. So there seems to be a link, therefore, on those old Malay inscriptions between this polity that controlled shipping here and the Ma'anyan and Malagasy. That's rather fascinating, don't you think? And of course, this is not too far-fetched at all. 
Um, sorry, this clicker is a bit too sensitive, or maybe I'm pressing it too hard. But here. It's not too far-fetched, a less well-known, we know the silk route, uh, but we don't know the cinnamon route. And said so there was a cinnamon route, and cinnamon route, unlike the silk route, does not hug the coastline. It traverses the Indian Ocean and goes past the Comoros. So those islands, because of the nature of Austronesian navigation, Austronesian navigation reaching as far as uh, Easter Island, you know, um, Hawaii, as well as uh, New Zealand, or Aotearoa, if you take the Maori name for it. Um, the way that Austronesian, if we say Austronesian, it sounds so remote. Actually, these are the Manians and the Malays and the Javanese. They, how they travel across the Indian Ocean was to use clusters of islands and certain other techniques. And so they could sail direct like that. Yeah, and they hit the East African coast and then settled Madagascar. And because of the nature of the linguistics and cultural distribution, it seems that they settled this side first, not this side, as you would have expected. So it went this way and then this way. But I'm going into too many details. Suffice to say that the thing, the, the thing I was talking about that connected uh, this route to Srivijaya uh, seems to suggest you know, the extent of Malay navigation during the time of the Buddhist period of Malay history. And of course, on, uh, on uh, Borobudur, which is not on, uh, in Malay-speaking regions, it's in central Java, uh, ref, uh, depicts such ocean-going vessels uh, in relation to, of course, from my perspective as an uh, architecture historian, very interesting, of, interestingly often juxtaposed with these house forms. So to me, that's interesting from the cultural point of view. It, the ship has even been uh, reconstructed at a rather small scale, actually, and actually used to, yes, this red, they actually wanted to prove the hypothesis that what they called Indonesian sailors, meaning Malay and Javanese, would have reached West Africa because of certain cultural traits there that seem to suggest Indonesian influence. So this is all, I'm putting this together because if you only looked at the Buddhist Malay history period and talked about the connection to India, then we don't understand the bigger context of Malay sailing yeah? and, and the fact that uh, Malay here, of course, would have included, uh, maybe don't just talk about it as Malay because this is shown on Borobudur, but Malayo-Javanese. Um, and of course, uh, coming back to the region, I mean, we've, we've traveled maybe rather too far. If you come back to the region, we get, however, a heavily uh, uh, cosmopolitan and diverse region uh, where references to uh, Malay uh, polities um, given in all sorts of accounts, Arab, Persian, Tamil, Sanskrit, and Chinese accounts. And they referred to a variety of names for these. Uh, they transliterated uh, uh, place names in their own ways. For example, Kalah Bar is the Arabic uh, attempt to, to say Kadah, coast. That's why you also have Malabar, Zanzibar, Zabar, yeah, uh, Ma'bar, sorry, Ma'bar. Ma'bar is the Tamil coast, Malabar is the Kerala coast, Zanzibar is the coast of Zanj or uh, Afri Eastern Africa. That's where, incidentally, the Malagasy, or rather the, the, the Malayo Javanese sailors would have arrived in East Africa, the Zanzibar. So here we have our own bar, Kalabar, not as well known though. And then you have Ramni in the Tamil inscription of the Cholas, it was Ilamuri Desa. So Desa, of course, Desh is the same as Bangladesh, that Desh country. Yeah, so it's saying Lamuri is another way to pronounce Ramni. Ramni is actually the Arabic rendition. So you've got all these multiple names of, of these polities. Um, Sribuja, uh, Sribuza, and all sorts of other transliterations of Srivijaya in Arabic and Persian. Uh, Zabak and Javaka. Javaka is in uh, Sinhalese uh, references. And then the mainland. Mainland Southeast Asians refer to people in this region collectively, whether Malay or Javanese, as Shavaya which is how the Malays refer and the Javanese refer to themselves when they are in the Middle East. They call themselves people of the Bilad al-Jawa, and so they are called Jawi. And so their writing is Jawi. So what I'm showing here is that there are multiple polities, but they all felt in some way or another a collective sense of uh, identity. So, and that's also what I'm showing here with this outline. This outline is showing the Malayo Western Malayo-Polynesian as well as Central Malayo Polynesian group of a uh, cluster of languages, which would include Champa. But also, interestingly, uh, in the next slide, we'll look at how the Javanese conceived of this 
as a region. I, I mentioned the Javanese because we don't have evidence of how the Malays themselves viewed this region as a whole, but we have the Javanese conception of this being the region of the Nusantara, as opposed to those outside of this conception of Nusantara. Only the Jav Javanese uh, have left us with that evidence. But if you look at this 1286 reference, and the, old, the only inscription from East Java uh, by King T Kertanegara of Singasari, that's in East Java, uh, found on a statue of the Amoga Pasha dispatched to a location here at the upper reaches of the Batanghari called Padang Rocho. Then it states that the, the, the statue, this massive statue, uh, was uh, sent Dari Bumi Jawa ke Suwarna Bumi. So there's yet another. Now, Suwarna Bumi in this inscription obviously means Sumatra. According to the Javanese, this is Suwarna Bumi. So, of course, Bangkok says that Suwarna Bumi is mainland Southeast Asia, right? They have the Suwarna Pum or Suwarna Bumi Airport. But if you listen to the old, uh, the Javanese, in this old Malay inscription of 1286, it says Suwarna Bumi is here. And it's, this is Bumi Jawa. There you go. The whole, I've just kind of gave, given you the whole morass of information, all the conflicting um, attributions of place names. So that's, that's what it's saying, eh? from David Bumi Jawa to Suwarna Bumi. And then you also have Langkasuka, Ilangasuka, so many different names. But um, then if you refer to the 1365 Javanese account, the famous Desha Warnana or Nagara Kartagama, then we have the following terms, right? We have, it refers to Champa as different from the rest of mainland Southeast Asia. In other words, it's referring to some kind of that Malayo-Polynesian connection because the Cham, of course, spoke a language cognate to Malay. Um, and then, now, Malayu, Tanah Malayu at that time, or Tanah Ri Malayu in Javanese, did not refer to the peninsula, it referred to Sumatra. And there were two ways in which the Nagara Kertagama referred to Sumatra, Tanah Rim Melayu or Sakahawat Melayu. And then, this is called Sakahawat Pahang because Pahang is the longest river on the peninsula. You know, every single state in, in Malaysia is referred to by the name of the river, the main river. Terengganu, right? Perak, Sungai Perak. Johor, Sungai Johor. And so on, right? Uh, well, there are exceptions to that, but so for example, Selangor is a little bit, there are many different rivers. So Selangor was the least Malay-ish, if you like, in its Bugis. But um, you have all of these Nusa Tanjung Negara referring to this, and then you have another term referring to the Eastern Islands. So this was the conception, Sanusa Nusa Makassar, in Javanese of 1365, referring to the whole uh, region with these names more specifically, and then collectively as Nusantara. Now, still on the use of terms, um, so we're still looking at accounts and testimonies about this whole period of uh, Malay Buddhist history. Here we come back to an old Malay inscription, the Talang Tuo inscription. This one dated to 606 on, in the Shaka calendar, which is the equivalent, the, the precise date I didn't write, is referred to in the precise date using the Indic calendar, but it's the equivalent of 23rd March 684 AD. So it's a precise date for this. What is interesting is this term parla, which is uh, an obsolete term today in Malay and in Javanese, but you still find it in Batak, in different Batak languages like Karo and Toba. So parla still in those languages refer to a park, just like it did in this old Malay inscription from 684 AD. But what I want to point out is that this park is conceived by the king of Sriwijaya at that time, to be an act of piety, of Buddhist piety. Yeah. And in this act of Buddhist piety, of course, the park would have certain uh, plants that are supposed to bring some benefit. And so what kind of plants are planted there? If you read this again, uh, referring to how Malay is used, it actually says that this Parwanda Punta Hyang Sri Jayanasa, the king, decided to plant nitanam di sini ya yeah, sebanyaknya niur can you recognize niur pinang enau rumbia dengan samisra is a, a sanskrit a variety of nya with the malay suffix kayu ni makan buahnya what does that mean kayu is the old malay term for pokok kayu yeah. kayu dimakan buahnya tatapi is no longer used in the same way in malay today tatapi is sanskrit tatapi here means also but today, tetapi means but. 
Aur puluh petung. Aur. You know that aur dengan tebing, right? Aur, the plant. And buluh betung. So, this is a, Bud- a park dedicated as a Buddhist act of piety. But the plants, I mean, this is of interest for landscape historians perhaps, eh? are all entirely native to the swampy southeastern Sumatran Malay environment. They couldn't get more localized than that. This park called Parlakshikshatra, with a Sanskrit name, had local plants. I don't know why nobody has pointed this out more strongly before this. I mean, this is really remarkable to me. And then, this is also my favorite part. It's really talking about how Malays acquired and re It basically is this whole ownership over uh, a, a, a form of uh, learning and a form of disposition in the world and um, uh, sources of knowledge, if you like. Interestingly, despite the amount of Sanskrit being used in this phrase that I'm quoting, um, Malay is in blue, Sanskrit is in black, so you can um, see the amount of Sanskrit words. The word used for acquiring knowledge vigorously or rigorously is Malay, Rajintahu, not Sanskrit. Not Sanskrit, but Malay, Rajintahu it says. What does Rajintahu mean in modern Malay? We can understand it perfectly, right? Yeah, to endeavour to know. There's so many other examples actually, but to me these are all very important as a preface before I look at the architecture. Because what I feel is when we look at what remains in brick or stone, we often have this very skewed view of foreign or Indianized influence without understanding that this was a literate culture in Old Malay that acquired knowledge in Sanskrit for its own use in its own terms and using Malay. So I think at this point, it is important for me to emphasize this was a Malay Buddhist civilization we're talking about. Yeah? It was literate, it wrote in Old Malay. Yes, it used a version of the Pallava script, but that version in the earliest inscriptions we see already differed from what was found in southern India. Yeah? So it's not from me, you can read this from Kapari. Yeah, he has written about this. So now we move to the second part of my presentation on Chandi or temple architecture, having that preface in mind. Now, of course, it wouldn't surprise you anymore, knowing what I'm interested in, to say that I'm looking at the local Malay and Javanese reworking of Indic concepts in architecture and of the architectural forms themselves, amalgamated with local ideas and local traditions of building. And so, what is the kind of Buddhist architecture that prevailed in India at about the time in which we're going to look at some temples in this region? Of course, we have to start with Nalanda. Nalanda is considered the most important uh, center of Buddhist learning of that time. And so this is 8th century Nalanda, or what remains of it in ruins. This is a, a plan of it. So these are basically monastic cells, cloisters of monastic cells, each of, each of which, like these, are actually little cellars, rooms, monks' cellars, arranged around a courtyard and arrayed in a row. And uh, facing them are a number of huge temples. They are massive. So this is one of them. Of course, they lie in ruins. Another example, just one of the... So, Nalanda, Paharpur, there are altogether, some would say, five such major centers of Buddhist learning and pilgrimage. Now, this example at Paharpur, in what is today Bangladesh, actually, both are Bengali. So, this is in... uh, Sorry, this is Bihar, so it's nearby. But both uh, this as well as other sites uh, for Buddhist learning are uh, in Bengal region. So this is in what is today Bangladesh or East, uh, East Bengal, if you like. There's West Bengal in India and East Bengal. But at Paharpur, the plan is rather different. The whole perimeter wall, the prakara, which in Malay today we call perkarangan, right? So we call it perkarangan. It's actually Sanskrit prakara. Prakara is this. Perimeter wall, prakara. So we call it perkarangan rumah. So somehow it got domesticated. Perkarangan rumah is prakara. The, the perimeter wall for a complex. In this case, a temple complex. Now, the prakara wall is where you find all the monastic cells. And then you at the center is this massive temple. One conjectural reconstruction, nobody can really verify it, is that it might have looked like that. But you notice these are all in red brick. 
Um, and then I point out the scale of things. So that is really massive, the example of Paharpur, uh, in comparison to Prambanan. Prambanan has 224 individual self-standing temples of a miniature size in comparison with the main temple. This is Angkor Wat, this is Chandisewu, which is Buddhist, and Borobudur, which is also Buddhist. So these are Buddhists from central Java, just as a kind of scale. What you notice is, besides the fact that Baharpur is very much larger, yeah, the concept of having something surrounding a central building has been translated rather differently in Southeast Asia. Very differently, in fact, from the architectural point of view. These are all not individual buildings, but cellars. Here, you don't have that. In fact, these are individual temples. Individual temples, individual temples. Yeah? And then flanking temples at the axis. You don't have that anywhere in India. So the translation of this idea is completely different in the region. Absolutely no precedent in India. Absolutely not. In Prambanan as well, you have the enclosure I will show you this later. It's actually all stepped terraced. There is no such example in India again. So the manifestation of temple architecture, if you were to be very superficial about it, looks very much influenced by India. But in the actual conception and the meaning of it, as well as the formal attributes, you can't make the comparison. Actually, this is not new at all. If you listen to Ferguson, a colonial era British scholar of Indian art, and he looked at Southeast Asia, he had a chapter, and this I've already written about, uh, where he remarked that Java upsets everything one is supposed to know about Indian architecture. When you look at Javanese examples, everything is completely different. He doesn't understand why. So, of course, he was talking about frustration because he expected it to be the same. But it's not. It wasn't at all. Yeah. Borobudur, I will talk about a little bit more. Borobudur is, again, another huge enigma. But uh, then we have to talk about the Malays, right? We've been talking about the Javanese and the Khmer. So where are the Malays? Well... In the polity called Malayu, this is the spread of temples, Buddhist temples. And this is only part of the picture. There are even more Buddhist complexes and temples spread across Morajambi. So if you understood the scale of it, Malay Buddhist, the, Malay, the Malayu Buddhist center in Morajambi is massive. But why do we not talk about it at all? Is it civilizational amnesia? What is it? I don't know. I've never quite understood it. We don't talk about it, right? I mean, it's absent in our consciousness, like I said earlier. But there you go. This is, and this is Nalanda. This is Nalanda. The Nalanda that you saw earlier, this one, if I were to put it to scale, is that big. And you thought Nalanda was massive, didn't you? And so was Paharpur, right? It was massive. But look at, Ch look at Morajambi, Malayu from which the ethnonym that we use to refer to Malays today comes from, Malayu. Malayu was a massive and very important Buddhist center from the accounts of Tibetans, uh, Tamils, uh, all sorts of peoples who traveled through the region. Chinese, particularly Chinese, because the Chinese had the propensity to write uh, autobiographies, autobiograph not autobiographies, well, they did write autobiographies of themselves, but they also wrote biographies of all sorts of people. The Indians themselves hardly wrote any biographies. And this I know because of the conversations I've had with uh, experts who look at uh, sources. Uh, I don't look at written sources the way they do. So according to them, it is most, mostly the Chinese uh, pilgrims eh, and Buddhist scholars who wrote biographies. So in these accounts, uh, by and large, the consensus is that this was a major center. And it seems the architectural remains corroborate that. Um, so in terms of scale, it is massive. In terms of distribution, ah, maybe this is why, right? Because unlike the other centers, the examples in, the, in Malayu, Morajambi, are today obscured largely by plants, yeah? vegetation. In addition, as architectural structures, they don't look nearly as impressive. Yeah? They are spread out. They have many different cloisters and enclosures, but they don't look as impressive. Yeah? But they are quite substantial nevertheless. Just another, this is a useful infographic uh, issued uh, by the Pemerinta Kabupaten, that means the, uh, what would that be, provincial uh, authority of, um, of, of the province of Jambi. Yeah? 
of uh, the province actually of Muara Jambi, sorry, Muara Jambi. So this is the distribution of uh, temples and uh, what some of the, I don't know why the projection looks so dark. Does it look very dark? Yes, I think it does from where I am. I'm not sure why it turns out like this blur and dark, but anyway. Um, this is one of the, so what, what do the temples look like? Um, now, what we have today is the center of so many different controversial um, uh, conjectures uh, and disputations. So, uh, Sukmono, uh, one of the uh, uh, major scholars uh, of uh, Indic architecture and archaeology in Indonesia, lamented the fact that this restoration, which happened before his time, was heavily distorted, he says, by Javanese presumptions or uh, assumptions, rather. So he disagreed with this reconstruction, and he also said he conjectures that most likely it was this kind of uh, uh, setup, and that the actual sanctuary was made of wood and ephemeral uh, ijuk uh, fiber for the roof. Uh, that is discussed by this particular scholar, Harirani Santico, but disputed by Veronique Dechrut, who wrote that it's not likely that this was actually a staircase. I'm sorry, it's so dark. It's supposed to not be so dark, but you should be able to see that it kind of faces a blank wall, and there you can see it here. And uh, she discusses why this is plausible, so that this could, in fact, be a solid building leading to a stupa. And this is from the 8th century. That means this is echoed, I'm sorry, is echoed much later in the 12th century. What's going on? Um, in the temples found at what is today Bagan in Burma, Myanmar, Bagan. So the Bagan temples likewise have the solid core and uh, the temple could be above it and then a spire, a stupa-like spire, the Sikhara stupa on top. So these are stupa temples, stupa prasadas. But those are from the 12th century in Bagan. In other words, the Malay examples preceded uh, by about three to four hundred years. And this seems to uh, be echoed by the fact that Malay forms of Buddhism, uh, now these, the Tibetan texts refer to Suvarnabhumi as the source of uh, the, the Buddhism that reached Tibet. Uh, and they're talking about this move from Tibet up north to what is today, uh, 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 to Tibet, from Sumatra, sorry, to Tibet. And so, uh, I mean, if, if, if what uh, Veronique de Groot says about uh, how to reconstruct and understand this temple, not this way and not the way we see it today, but in, in, in the form of the stupa prasada-like form, which means you have a solid, massive uh, building, which is actually the base for a stupa. Stupa is solid and massive. Uh, then we are, we are looking at the precedents, today quite badly damaged, for uh, what later was built in the 12th century onwards in Bagan. Burma, yeah, and it's part of that flow northwards from Malay centers of Buddhism in Sumatra. Um, another example, also from Malayu at Muara Jambi, the Chanditingi. Now, Chanditingi, now, of course, if I, want, I thought I should make a joke at this juncture. In this reconstruction, all of the Pago Pago are there, right? I mean, the stupas. Huh? So when we refer to Pago Pago, actually, in the paintings, we are referring to stupas. The, word, the English word pagoda comes from Dagoba. Now, Dagoba refers to the stupa, uh, that, that particular form of the bell stupa. So these are Dagobas or pagodas. Uh, they're all gone today though, so what you see are just these plain looking uh, stepped platforms. And that's another very, very interesting and unique feature of temples in this region. Java was the, the, the site of the earliest such cases in the 8th century of these step platforms. Another center where you see these massive step platforms are uh, Cambodia. And the third place you see it would be the Malay Buddhist center. So these huge platforms upon which you find uh, different uh, structures, in this case, miniature stupas. Yeah. Other examples, this one is from not Muara Jambi anymore, but it is in Riau province today, it's in Muaratakus. So it's near the border between Malay-speaking and Minangkabau-speaking uh, regions. Um, in Riau province, you have this huge complex, uh, quite massive, um, 
uh, part of a larger spread of uh, structures, but only this has been uh, more or less completely restored. Uh, it has an enclosure. This is quite typical of uh, the Sumatran complexes, to have an enclosure with only one opening to the east. And then this would be considered, the one opposite this main uh, entrance would be considered the major temple. Although this, of course, looks bigger, right? So this, would, is, this is considered the major structure. And in this case, this major structure happens to be the pagoda, the stupa. Yeah, the stupa. And uh, next to it, so this is the entrance, the, the staircase, to go up for the circumambulation. So that's the staircase over there with the plinth. And then to its side is this massive uh, base of... Uh, this one you know for sure is also another chandi. Uh, sorry, another uh, stupa yeah? or dagoba. Mm. And then you have two more at the back. So this is a reconstruction of the, the two other structures at the back I was talking about, number two, which consists of one main pagoda here or Dagoba, and then this is quite interesting. This comes from the 11th to 12th century, but it seems to be uh, echoing the arrangement of smaller stupas around a central stupa seen on the upper terraces of Borobudur. By the time this was built in the 11th to 12th centuries, Borobudur would have been about three to 400 years old, just to think of the time scale. By the time this little echo of Borobudur's upper terraces was built, these upper terraces of Chandi Bungsu in Moratakus, Borobudur would have been about 300 to 400 years old, because Borobudur is 8th century. This was 11th century, yeah, this particular one. But in the way in which it is distributed, it's quite interesting. In fact, the whole complex, the arrangement of things, is not unlike what you would see elsewhere in other Buddhist complexes around the region. Right? The particular arrangement and the formation of uh, stupa uh, profiles. So in that sense, we are looking here at something that is quite unique to the Sumatran uh, Malayu uh, case uh, of Buddhist architecture. And then you go further up north to Padang Lawas. Padang Lawas is even further away from uh, the centre at Malayu. Um, it is already uh, between... Uh, uh, it, it's an overland portage route uh, between... Facing, uh, facing the Straits of Malacca would be the Kingdom of Panay, and then facing the Indian Ocean to its south, if you went through the portage of Padang Lawas, it's actually uh, the, uh, a plateau region between, uh, in a gap, in a pass, between the central mountain range, the Bukit Barisan of Sumatra. So this is, if you can imagine, this is in the highlands, yeah? at this pass, a gap between the central mountain range of Sumatra, you get the site. So if you went up north to uh, Straits of Malacca coast, it's Panay. If you went south, and Panay was one of the sites referred to in the conquest of the Cholas. But this, uh, um, to the, if, in this site, if you move south, you will reach Barus or Panchur. Barus or Panchur is the port city from which Hamza Fansuri, Fansur is the Arabic rendition of Panchur, which is the alternative name of Barus, uh, came from. So Hamza Fansuri's hometown is south of this site, if you went by the portage route just to give it the space context, the, the geographic context. But you have some rather interesting... Um, now, in the case of Padang Lawas, we finally get uh, the classic form of the Chaitya Graha or the Garba Graha, the, the, the cellar for the deities, yeah, which we, we don't have uh, uh, examples of in, in this... Uh, that we can restore up to the to the base of the finial. This would have been a finial in the form of a stupa on top. This is the typical expected drum at the base of a stupa. So we know this is a stupa finial. So this is a stupa temple. Um, we don't have examples like this with a cella like that in the, the, the two other sites to the south in Sumatra. So in other words, this is quite a rare example. There are other such examples also from Padang Lawa. So in other words, these examples from Padang Lawa are quite precious. Chandi architecture from um, Sumatra that, for which we can see this much. I mean, if you've been to Kedah, you would know, right? The only thing you see are the bases. And that's because, the conjecture is that, that's because uh, most of the temples in uh, Kedah, if they were not stupas, that means they're solid, they would have had pillar, I mean, they have pillar bases, and so the superstructure, the columns and the roofs are in 
perishable materials, in other words, timber. Yeah. So it's quite different um, in the case of this site in Parang Lawas. Um, another example, so I'm just showing you. Now in this case as well, you have this central temple which is uh, completely built up as a saline brick. Um, and then you have these platforms. Now the kind of platforms uh, that you see a lot in uh, Kedah Tua or Old Kedah yeah, platforms. But not exa I'm not suggesting they're exactly the same, they're quite different. So in, in Kedah, we'll see later, uh, the formation would, would have been a, 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 a front um, hall platform usually rectangular, could be square, the mandapa, the mandapa, and then you have the, uh, the actual uh, core temple. But here, you have a core temple built up in brick entirely. And there have been comparisons, sorry, comparisons with what was taking place in Java around about the same time. I'm just showing a selection because there's so many other temples from central Java. This is the thing, if I'm talking about Sumatra. So Sumatra has so few remains. Java, on the other hand, has so many. Whether it is in brick, like this, red brick, or whether it is in stone. And this period I'm looking at, 1370, is in the heart of the Majapahit period. Majapahit is from 1297 to 1520s, 1527 thereabouts. That means Majapahit is so long-lived, it precedes the rise of Malacca and outlived Malacca. So everything you read in the Solalatu Salatin of Sejarah Melayu about Majapahit shows Malay anxiety about this neighbour of ours, right? Majapahit. Because Majapahit completely, not only did it, like I said, it, it, it was already established, very established. So for Malacca to have maintained its independence was no mean feat, actually, if you look at it another way. For Malacca to have maintained its independence in the face of Majapahit's wish to like, take, take it up, absorb it into its dominions, right, was quite no mean feat. And uh, you could say those tales in Hikayat Hang Tua where Hang Tua was forever, you know, trying to find some way to outwit these crafty Javanese. It's always written as crafty, wily Javanese. It's entirely true. I'm sure the anxiety would have been quite big. But coming back to Javanese architectural examples, so the comparisons have been made between these uh, 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 examples of Buddhist uh, red brick uh, temple cellars, right? The, Gar uh, the Chaitya Graha, with the examples you find uh, from Central Java at around about the same time. Um, and so that's Padang Lawas, just to give you the context. I should have started with this when I was talking about... Uh, yeah, so Barus is here, and then you have um, Panai up here. And uh, earlier I, talk, I spoke about Padang Rocho, which is right here. That's the upper reaches of the Batanghari, which is the river that flows through Muara Jambi or Malayu further south. Muara Takus is here in the, um, you could say, the border cultural regions, or the border between the Malay-speaking and the Minangkabau-speaking cultural regions. And that's Palembang down there, the site of Sriwijaya. Um, and of course, this I took from the Tribune news of uh, Sumatra in Jambi. Uh, you also have remains like this. So this is Chandi Kedaton. This is before they excavated the earth, just to give you a sense of what is involved when... I'm not an archaeologist, so... We have to take our hats off to how archaeologists have to deal with uh, these discoveries. And so um, the reconstruction of temples is definitely not easy because they're very, oftentimes, I'll show you later when we look at another example from Java, how impossible sometimes a task appears before the excavation. So really when they say excavation, it is really literally excavation. This is the base of a stairway. We know that because this is a pair of makaras that would form the terminal end of the balustrades, flanking the steps up to the uh, base for the circumambulation, upon which you get the cellar of the temple. Discovered in situ is very precious, and then it has inscriptions on it, which is again very precious. Um, but what I want to point out is less well known is the fact that there is a makara from Malacca, and here I want to go into the transition period. Because when we talk about Malacca, we often don't remember that when Malacca was founded, the ruler by name Parameswara, now he's said to be Hindu, but very likely he was not Hindu. You know, he wouldn't have just been Hindu, he would have also been Buddhist. Because the Sejarah Melayu, I'm kind of jumping the topic a little bit, talks about the Abhisheka, the consecration ritual, which appears to refer to Buddhist rites. And he came from Palembang. Palembang was not a Hindu center. The Malays of Palembang, Malayu, and Padang Lawas were Buddhist. 
So I don't know what is going on. Is it the Malay me memory has fudged a little bit or what? I don't know. Yeah? But, but nevertheless, nevertheless, we have this makara, a tantalizing piece of evidence. Only the makara, nothing else. Maybe not surprisingly, the Malayus in Malacca, being Sumatran, huh? I mean, they would have, maybe they wouldn't have thought it too strange to dismantle some of the temples in pre-Islamic Malacca to build the mosque and other structures. I mean, after the conversion, of course, it makes sense, right? And so maybe they didn't know what to do with the Makara, and so it was left there. It's rather interesting. Um, the, the Makara was actually found at the base of what would have been the Royal Hill, what is today called, I mean, we're so in love with colonialism, right? We call it St. Paul's Hill. So at the base of St. Paul's Hill, we have a Makara coming from around about the early 14th century, I mean, uh, early 15th century, or late 14th century. If you believe some accounts that say Malacca was already there in about 1390s, we don't know for sure. We don't know exactly when Malacca was founded. But there you go, you have this, and then of, I'm just comparing it with a Makara from um, the site of Sungai Maskada, a very early date. Seventh century would have been the time when we, you know those inscriptions in Old Malay that I showed you earlier? That seventh century as well. So it's contemporaneous. When those inscriptions were made, this was in existence in Sungai Kedah. Just to give it a contemporaneous kind of uh, cross-referencing. And so we come to the Malay Peninsula. Or if you refer to the Javanese of the 14th century, not the Malay Peninsula, but Sakahavat Pahang. Right? They didn't call this the Malay Peninsula, they called it Pahang. So the peninsula of Pahang, one of the smaller rivers, Sungai Petani. Yeah? And then subsidiary rivers, right? There are there's Sungai Mas, for example. This distribution, now, having known the distribution of temples in Sumatra and in particular in Morajambi, it should come as no surprise to see Kedah having such also an impressive distribution of temples. Yeah. But in the case of Kedah, there are several complications. And the complication includes the architectural typology found in Kedah is different, is different from the examples from, from Sumatra. Yeah. They seem closer in some respects to what is seen in South India. But they're not the same. But they're not the same. Now, having said this, it, reminds, it would remind some of us, if you're familiar with the literature, of what Quaritch Wales was talking about when he talked about local genius. So Quaritch Wales was this scholar who came out with this term, uh, or rather concept of the local genius. And he says that you know, the further... Too, when you're too close to the source of Indic religions, uh, then the, the kind of innovation that takes place is rather limited because the, the source of the inspiration for this religion that you are following is so near and so you kind of follow it a little bit. Probably the movement of craftsmen could also have been easier and so you didn't need to innovate so much. This is his hypothesis, of course. And so according to his kind of thinking, that is why sites in Burma did not innovate as much. Whereas the Khmer, and the Javanese completely innovated far away from Indian precedent. This is his thinking. So it's, his is like a conflation of geographic proximity and innovation. You know, it's almost the scale uh, is aligned. You know, the further away you are, the more innovative. I mean, looking at the Kedah case kind of, kind of uh, shows you why he thought that way. Yeah? Because Kedah, he was of course aware of the Kedah case because I'm talking about this person here, Corridge Wales and wife. So when he wrote that, he was actually talking about uh, his reflection on why Kedah uh, more closely resembles uh, the Indian precedent. Yeah. But at that time, he was also very much living in the Indian colony narrative of the Greater India School of Thought. You know, India was... 1947 was when India gained independence. So, of course, the Indian Sanskritizing impetus was alive and well, and when we were finally freed ourselves from the shackles of British colonialism, let's imagine Indian colonization elsewhere. You know, it was a, it was a very, uh, I mean, that's very strange because to understand that Malays were Buddhist and built temples did not require Indian colonization. They didn't need to be colonized by whatever Indian community in order to have become temple builders. Yeah, they didn't have to. But it was strange because it was thought to be that way. Um, um, I'm not going to go through the, the whole list because it will take too long, but um, I want to go on to look at, uh, to show you what uh, you can see if you open some books 
um, on the excavations and the findings. And this in particular allows us to see an image of what I was trying to describe to you. There is a platform, a brick base in front of the main cellar, yeah, which is higher. So the plinth for the main cellar would be higher. And this would have been the mandapa and that's the vimana. So a lot of the temples of Kedah would conform to this type. And then there are other variations such as this. So this one, the plinth is much taller with um, these uh, reticulated uh, moldings. Yeah, in that sense as well. So all of these different uh, base architecture um, profiles um, await a proper uh, dating, or rather they have been dated by many different scholars, but they all dispute with each other how it should be periodized. Um, so there are a few, and there is no lack of uh, periodization theories or conjectures, if you like, not theories, uh, about Kedah examples. But I want to just single out um, this particular case of the, the, the conjectural reconstitution of uh, the Tsungai Batu Pahat temple, which received a lot of publicity because of its excavations. Um, I can show you on the timeline, right? Did I write it? Yes, Chandi Bukit Batu Pahat. Yeah, it received a lot of publicity because of the timing. If this was 47, this is after 57. So Malaya, Federation of Malaya, you know, was new and independent and this uh, excavation was uh, seen as a very important uh, way to look at uh, the long durée understanding of Malayan history. Um, and so this particular reconstruction uh, of Sungai, uh, Chandi Sungai Batu Pahat uh, assumes or uh, uh, made a conjecture that uh, it could have had some kind of a timber um, uh, what do you call this, timber, sorry, timber uh, lean-to roof supporting and surrounding the main cellar, which was assumed to have a superstructure like that. This is entirely conjectural because there is no single temple in Kedah for which we have any firm evidence that this body and superstructure of the temple was built entirely in brick. Unfortunately, we don't have evidence of even a single example. So the conjecture right now is most likely the superstructure would either have been solid stupas or wooden superstructure. Yeah. And this, of course, is a reconstruction based on the fact that there are timber wooden posts or sockets for posts in the platform. And so then we would have had columns, right? But how the roof would have been supported, or rather the shape of the roof is, of course, conjectural. I also just want to point out a second thing, and that is the dispute between these two gentlemen about the pripih, well, and pripih is a Javanese word, of course, but uh, these are caskets for de deposits, ritual deposits, to consecrate a temple. And um, this particular form of the pripih casket, or it's called pripih casket in Javanese, we don't know what the Kedah people would have called it, but this form, with a belanga inside, and then um, square surrounding the belanga to place certain ritual deposits, and then this enclosure, um, made of uh, clay, are uh, closer to Javanese examples, but different. So it's rather interesting. And um, you know, the dispute is whether or not this is Javanese influence or whether it's just the Kedah variation of the uh, original form um, of what is intended to be the place to um, the casket to place uh, the ritual deposit. Um, so even there, we don't have the full answer, and probably we never will, because it's based on opinion. Do you opine this or that? Uh, but the point is that it is different from the Javanese examples, but very similar to it. And so this whole thing about different and yet similar runs through our narrative. And maybe even saying it's similar but different is, you know, kind of a manifestation of another kind of anxiety. But here's another similar but completely different case. I want to talk about this, the cellar. Right? How and where did uh, our uh, deconstruction take its reference? Uh, where, uh, how, how, did it refer, uh, how did it come to this reconstruction and where does it come from? Actually, it comes from uh, the classic form of the Chandi in central Java that had become standard fare by the 8th century. So in Java, by the 8th century, these are, by the way, Hindu temples, not Buddhist, just to clarify. So in Java, two religions coexisted with temple forms from the earliest periods. 
yeah, both Buddhist and Hindu. So in this case, it's Shaivite. Uh, but the form of the temple is uniquely Javanese. And the iconography of placement, this you can read about in Jacques Dumasse, The Temples of Java. So he talks about how by the 8th century, the Javanese suddenly had all these stone temples, their own form, very different from what is found in India, more importantly, built of dressed stones. Because in India at that time, a lot of the temples were built out of carving solid rock. I kid you not, solid rock in Tamil Nadu, Mamalapuram, uh, or, or the full name Mahabalipuram, uh, they, they, uh, and uh, what is the other temple? I forget suddenly. Two of these temples, yeah? the Shaw Temple, for example, was carved out of solid rock. But in Java, different technical skills were required to use dressed stones to build a temple. That's completely different from the technical point of view. Yeah? And uh, more importantly, certain forms are not seen in India. So, for example, this portico with this roof, which imitates wooden construction, a roof like that. Today, you would look at it and say it's Thai. You expect a Thai restaurant. But actually, this precedes the migration of the Thais into what is today Thailand. Uh, it was a roof form that was shown many times in the temple reliefs of central Java. So at that, his, that point in Javanese history, such roof forms were in Java. This one is a lean-to sloping this way, whereas the other one had the gable end. So these are... Rather interesting because, now Dumasi was saying, this points to wooden prototypes for these brick, uh, sorry, uh, for these stone temples. I just want to take us a little bit out of uh, the context of Java and talk about something very related. This whole thing about translating something from wood into stone. Can you guess which other architectural tradition that is very well known because everybody knows it like it's general knowledge that also translated forms from wood into stone? The Greek temple. Now, the Greek temple has a roof. That's ridiculous. It's made of stone. Why do you build a sloping roof? And if it's made of stone, why do you have all these columns and beams? That's not how you use stone. Have, have you ever thought of that? That's because the Greek temple was originally all in wood. It would have had wooden pillars and then wooden beams and the wooden roof. Until today, um, no, well, when, when, the, when, when the Greeks decided to build their temples in stone, however, they preserved the damn form, everything. And they even kept what is called the dentate. Those of you who are familiar, the dentate is actually the ends of wooden beams for the roof, the ceiling. You know, how absurd is that? You even keep the pretense that these are wooden beams coming out of your stone. Now, if you understand that, then you understand this is quite a universal, well, not universal, but it's quite a general tendency. I can talk about how even the gonjong roof of the Minangkabau is fake. The real, the real form, why it's shaped like that, you can only see in Batak architecture. So the Minangkabau kept the shape, but the construction changed, so they forced the shape. So actually, the structure is all not the way it should be. The way it should be is in Batak architecture. But you see, so that's another example of wanting to keep the shape and the profile, but changing the technique. In this case, changing not just technique, the technique is contingent upon material use. So because it uses stone, so we come back to this. So then you understand it from that perspective. The Javanese were going through this form of transposing timber architecture into stone. And so what I'm saying, therefore, in this very long-winded way, is if we don't know what was taking place up here, and if it was built in brick, uh, not built in brick, but built in wood, it could very well have been somewhat similar to this, because this was, in fact, based upon timber prototypes. I think you, you kind of get the parallel. I'm not saying it would have looked exactly like this, but it is very similar. Now, if you refer back to Jacques Dumasse, this particular French scholar who looks at the temples in Java, you would also find that he talks about how many of um, the depictions of temples on Javanese, uh, 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 on Javanese stone reliefs, eh, on the walls of Javanese temples, seem to show the kinds of wooden prototypes existing in Java at that time. And not wooden, well, wooden prototypes makes it sound strange. In other words, temples built in wood that would have served as prototypes for many of these Javanese temples. Now, how different are these from Indian examples? So if you look at this, what, what, it's quite interesting because that's the temple, right? Now, the temple has miniature temples, miniatures of itself built in array around the smaller, the, the, the multi-tiered roof. So miniatures of itself these are all miniatures of itself. And then pin the, so this pinnacle is abbreviated and becomes large. Miniature temples around it. So firstly, of course, the temple, the core temple form 
is used as the prototype for miniatures of itself to inhabit the roofscape. Now, how would you compare it with India? The idea is the same, isn't it? That there are also, in Tamil Nadu, the Mahabalipuram Shaw Temple I was talking about, 8th century as well, so they are contemporary, contemporaries. Eh? Like I said, this is one single piece of solid rock that was carved, like sculpture. Yeah? Whereas in Java, it's built out of dressed stone. You have to carve the stone, you have to build it piece by piece, and you have to think about the structure, how it doesn't collapse, how you span doorways and so on, how you create openings. So it's rather different, but although the concept is the same, the articulation of the temple is entirely different. Not only the material, but also the articulation. What is important is here you have the idea of the front portico or pavilion, if you like, which here is changed entirely into a different kind of portico, two styles, of course. Yeah. And also the importance of the plinth, which seems to have been in place very early in Java. Whereas in India, the plinth does not look like that. So this idea of a plinth is rather different when you come to the Javanese examples, and it seems to echo what we see in Kedah, yeah? which is why you can say Kedah is rather, I mean, there is a family resemblance to other Southeast Asian cases, but it seems to not be exactly the same as, I mean, look at this, huh? same thing. There is no uh, articulation of a, a kind of plinth like this um, in the same way that you find on many of the Javanese temples. Instead, you have uh, some kind of a gallery around the temple in this particular case. Of course, there are variations. So I cannot, uh, uh, what do you call this, um, simplify it too much. But one uh, standard um, feature is that the plinth for a single temple is a defining feature of the Javanese temple. So one way to date Javanese temples is to look at the plinth and look at the moldings. Eh? So the moldings allow you to date the temples. That's how uh, character, that's how key and significant characteristic the plinth is in, in the Javanese Chandi architecture. And of course, uh, talking about that, this is the closest I could find to something like this, where you have um, the ratna, the jewels. So these are, I mean, if you imagine it, you know, if you know this is called ratna jewel, then these are bejeweled temples, right? So the closest in Java would be this, but again, it's articulated very differently. In fact, each of these are conceived as individual temples uh, with a profile that resembles the main temple in abbreviated form as well. So in other words, it takes this as its precedent yeah, um, to create these multiple uh, miniature temples that serve as the balustrade for the plinth. So this is a plinth with, if you like, a balustrade, like a railing. Yeah. Now, um, of course, if, if we were talking about the evolution of the Sela form in Java, then I would talk about other things. But I think I'm showing this here only because I wanted to show you um, the way in which the temple form in Java, uh, starting with these smaller prototypes, could be enlarged into ever larger forms. So this is the example from, from Banan, which is massive and already has a kind of uh, false upper story articulation for the main body. And uh, more importantly, this form of the cella is the germinating point for other temple forms in Southeast Asia. So Champa and Cambodia um, takes, our, takes this particular articulation of the central, this meaning the central Javanese uh, 8th to 9th century standardization of a classic form of the Garbhagraha as their template. Uh, in Champa and Cambodia. So these are not direct from India, but via the Javanese reinvention. And so quite a number of scholars talk about this, this whole transmission from Java, where it took its own Javanese form, and then uh, other Southeast Asian temple traditions uh, have some kind of cousin relationship to Java rather than from India. So that's also something that I think we, we, we don't understand. And so where is Kadas' position and Sumatra's position in relation to this? So there are many discussions about that. Now, besides looking now, another point I want to make here is, besides looking at only the temple body, we also need to think of the temple in relation to its context. You remember I was telling you how Prambanan does this. Eh? So Prambanan is interesting as well in the sense that it is Shaivite as the main temple, but the other two temples are dedicated to the other two 
deities in the Hindu Trimurti. It also has a temple dedicated to Vishnu and Brahma. This is completely unprecedented in India, never. There is no such temple complex in India. So the Javanese is something the, the Indians themselves would never have done. It has one palladium, the state temple, which has Vish, Shai, Shai, Shiva as the center because the king would have been shy, right? But then he places two other temples flanking it like that to Brahma and Vishnu. That is completely unprecedented. It's almost like textbook Hinduism. The Javanese decided, oh, if they haven't done it, we'll do it. Okay. And then built 224 Parwara temples, each one of which is dedicated to some region in its empire. So each of them has a... So what I'm saying is, therefore, this is completely rooted in local conceptions and reworkings. There are also, there's also the enigma of this third enclosure, which is tilted at an angle, but the axis is maintained. So the conjecture is that this maybe is the grid of the urban settlement in which Prambanan was located, or maybe the grid of whatever network of streets or something, because it is tilted. Java has many of these examples of uh, orientation that puzzles. Remember I was saying that Ferguson was one scholar who said Java completely baffles him. So one of the examples. And also this terracing. So I was saying if we look beyond the cella, the temple uh, body, we, we will start to also look at aspects of the setting, the architectural landscaping. So in the case of Prambanan, we notice terraces. Yeah? So each of these are actually on their own terrace with steps down, steps down, steps down, steps down, steps down, out and then steps up to the plinth. So the whole thing is a gigantic terrace. The whole thing is built on a platform of stone, terraced. So you need to really understand that this is a massive undertaking. Prambanan is really huge. And there is no such example in India like that. And so if you come to Kedah, ah, okay, we have terraces again. And the terraces, once you start looking for them, are quite extensive. So Kedah is not just made of those temple bodies, it's actually made up of a series of terraces, which links it to similar ideas about the setting for such sacred enclosures in the rest of Southeast Asia. Yeah, so it has, I mean, this is um, one part, this is the most core structure, right? The, um, the, the, tra the dual uh, platform I was referring to earlier. And then you have um, Placing this, you can place this in the context of its larger terraced landscape setting. Yeah. And larger and larger. So a lot of the sites in Kedah conform to this. In Java, you get such cases as well. This is the main cellar. Now it seems to stand on a plinth, yes, which is surrounded by a moat. The whole thing is surrounded by another enclosure after the moat, which has a gateway, which goes down to another terrace, goes down and down and down and out. So it's part of a larger landscape of terraces. Not just the temple body, but that larger. Now, this conception is not there in India. It's not like that in India. Okay, I have to tell you that. It's not that like that. So this is something that seems to come from something else. And I know at the risk of sounding old-fashioned, uh, it's out of fashion, right, to be structuralist and say that there are certain deep-rooted structures of, you know, thinking and a mental template for things. But it seems that in the Malayo-Polynesian or Austronesian cultures, which links the Malayo-Polynesians, I mean, the Malays and Javanese with the Polynesians and the Micronesians, this idea of such terraces, terrace complex and enclosures for sacred structures seem to be shared, a shared attribute. If you go to the Marae in different uh, Polynesian societies, Hawaii as well, you would get these uh, forms of temples, and they are terraced like that. Um, and Indonesian archaeologists recognize this because many of the Javanese cases are so different from anything you would expect uh, from Indian precedent, although this one has resonances to the Sri Lankan monastic complex. Eh? So the gateway, the triple gateway, has been identified with... Uh, parallel example in Sri Lanka. But the overall landscaping and terracing uh, have something to do with this idea of, uh, this rather old idea of developing terraces. This is a different site that was Ratu Boko. Where is it written here? Ratu Boko Terraces, from 9th century. Uh, oh yes, and in Javanese, these terraced uh, sites are called Punden. So it comes from the Javanese word Pundi, which is an elevated site of reverence. So a place with a pundi is a pundian or punden in Javanese. 
So uh, another Pundan like uh, form is the state temple. This is the state temple of, uh, of uh, Majapahit. Yeah? There's two names. Uh, sometimes it's called Palah, and then now this is usually called uh, Panataran. So it has the main gate here, another gate here, and a third gate here, so the, to the innermost enclosure, and a series of platforms like that. So this really, really, in a way, reminds us of, this is 12th to 14th century. So if you recall the kinds of temples we see in Morajambi earlier, 12th century, a lot of it were enclosures like this. So there seems to be parallel developments here taking place between Java and, uh, and um, Sumatra and then Kedah. Yeah, so what it looks like from the third tier of the main temple in the third enclosure, looking back to the second and the first enclosure. Most of the walls have gone, so you just see the terraces and different platforms. And so this is, the, if this is to the same scale. If you were to compare, again, this tilt, nobody can, un nobody can explain why Panataran is tilted like that and facing west. You know, it's tilted off-axis. It's not as though the Javanese didn't know the north and south. In Javanese culture, north and south, east and west is very important as, uh, as this uh, cosmological uh, understanding of how to cite things. But many of the Javanese temples don't conform to the north, south, east, west, the cardinal directions. Just like, I mean, it reminds us of Rapambanan. Yeah? Yeah. But uh, the important thing here is that it moves from the concentric, but even here, the con concentricity is rather offset, right? Or eccentric, to the thoroughly eccentric linear courtyard layout in East Java. And so that's the, the eccentric late example is the kind that you, other examples, this is completely eccentric, so it now elongates to the front. It is very much resonant with uh, the cases we see in Kedah. These are just more examples, as I said, in, among uh, Indonesian archaeologists, the connection is well known uh, between uh, these terrace sites and older pre-Indic, pre-Hindu or pre-Buddhist uh, sites, terrace sites. Uh, and this particular case is a rather exciting one in comparison with Kedah because uh, this is the one I wanted to show as a kind of a case where excavations can be really crazy. When this was first discovered, a farmer accidentally hit his hoe at the pinnacle of the central temple. And so the excavation commenced and it, com it continued and continued and so they discovered this and then this and then stopped. Because I don't know what else, you know, if you continue excavating, what else would you be able to find? I mean, isn't it crazy amount of earth you had to excavate just to discover this? So he just hit the top, and then the rest had to be excavated. But importantly, this temple, now you, it looks like a badly risen cake, right? Like it didn't, it didn't rise. Huh? That's because this is a rare example of a combination between a masonry main cellar and wooden superstructure. Timber posts around it, here inside the wall, resembling the kind that we saw earlier at Chandi Sungai Batu Pahat, yeah, where there were timber posts around the centre, right? So this is very, very similar to that case. Uh, this one, though, the, the, the enclosure is more or less concentric rather than eccentric. But there are, that means, uh, cases for comparison. Um, I, I just wanted to also talk about the fact that uh, in, in, um, in Java, we are lucky to have a lot of inscriptions and so the inscriptions allow people like De Caspari to reconstruct uh, the thinking that goes behind the form. Right? Otherwise, we only have the form. So in Kedah, that's what we are faced with, right? We only have the form and nothing else. There are very few inscriptions about the temples. Yeah, we have inscriptions that are Buddhist formulas, but not about the temples. Whereas in Java, there is an inscription of 842 AD, which talks about this Borobudur as the Bumi Sambara, but the Bumi Sambara is not called a stupa or a stupa prasada or a mandala, not any of these Sanskrit terms, but a kamulan. Now, if you knew Sanskrit, you'd be scratching your head. Yeah, I know mula. What is kamulan? It has the prefix and suffix from Malay. Kamulaan. The place of origin, mula. Mula is Sanskrit, but kamulan is no longer Sanskrit. It's Sanskrit with Malay affixes. This is at the heart of what I'm talking about, how in this uh, Malay and Javanese Indic cultural transposition eh, into local terms, Sanskrit is completely reworked, temple forms are completely reworked. 
into terms that fit into the local understanding of things and symbolism. So what is going on here, if you understand Kamulan, is that it is a place of origin. And this completely fits in with Javanese ideas of the Punden. The Punden is usually reserved as a site to commemorate ancestors, which in Javanese and Malay is referred to by the term Hyang. So that's why the old Malay term for Salat, right? Today people will not say Sembahyang anymore, I think. Why? I don't know. But Sembahyang is the composite of two Malay words, right? Sembah, homage, and Hyang. Hyang refers to deity or ancestor or whatever you want to call it. Some people would protest against the idea of the ancestor. It's not so much ancestor, but those that came before. And those, when you die, you return to this realm of the spirits. So that is what is referred to as Hyang. Yeah? It's a kind of monistic almost, a conception of, of, of the cosmos. But this Kamulan and the, the idea that this is like a Punhen um, is in resonance with each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then so when you understand that, then you start to see. Now, Angkor Wat is a late example in Cambodia after the return of Jayavarman, the, wait, I forget, six or seven, from, from what he called Chaveya. Nobody knows what Chaveya he's referring to. He says he declares his independence from Chaveya. Now, Chaveya could be Java, could be Sumatra, we don't know. But that was the term the Khmais and the Javanese today used to refer to Nusantara, lah, the Malayo you know, the, the Malayo Javanese world, yeah, Chavea. Like Jawi, I told you, right? If you say Jawi, it means, it means people from Bilad al Jawa, which is the Arab way of rendering. Jawa means Sumatra and Jawa, Java, and of course the peninsula. But um, so all of these then can be conceived as ideas of that terrorist form. Yeah. So then when you, when you think of it that way, it also is very sophisticatedly married to, uh, merge with, Buddhist uh, cosmological ideas and uh, symbolism. So, I mean, you, if you're very well versed with Borobudur, this is old, uh, this is old, uh, old news, right? That the terraces of Borobudur, I'm so sorry, it's so dark. And in the original slides, it's not this dark. You can actually make out the terraces. Uh, this, this is where you get the terraces of the, sorry, where is my uh, terraces? Here. So you get the lowest terrace and then the middle terraces and then the upper terraces, right? They are referred to by Sanskrit terms as um, uh, rupa datu, the realm of form, uh, sorry, uh, karma, uh, karma datu, the realm of action, and then rupa datu, the realm of form, and then uh, uh, arupa datu, the realm of formlessness. And so this is translated in architecture and geometry as the places of um, rectilinear uh, corridors which you, are, you have to turn, you keep turning and you are completely surrounded by a profusion of images. A profusion. Remember, I was telling you this roof looks like a Thai roof. You know, the one that, that you today would associate with Thai roofs. Eh? So it's in Javanese uh, architectural repertoire at that time. But you are completely surrounded by this profusion of images telling you all sorts of stories from Buddhist tales. Um, and so it's the realm of form. Uh, now, when you go up to the upper terraces, then remember this is the one I was saying, there's an echo of it in Chani Bongsu. You remember that? The one with the stupa, central stupa surrounded by smaller stupas. Now that's an echo in the 12th, 11th to 12th century of an 8th century precedent found in central Java. This particular form of the central stupa surrounded by a ring of three round stupas on round platforms. So this is the abstract conceptualization of the realm of formlessness. The, the other thing, of course, is I'm kind of diverging away from our focus here on the Malay realm, but the Javanese monument of Borobudur is unique in that it created this never seen before and never seen since stupa form. Stupas are supposed to be solid, but this one is hollow and it's perforated in two ways. You can perforate it in lozenge or at the top you perforate it in square openings. Can you see that square? This is square. And then the lower two terraces are lozenge openings. And inside is a life-sized statue of a seated Buddha. Never seen before never seen since. Only Borobudur. So it's really quite fantastic. So I'm kind of going out of topic for a while. But now we're going on to the third. Am I making good progress for time? I have to speed up, I think. So for Prashasti and Aksara, I think yeah, we, we can be a little bit fast. This is a short section. But uh, we already went through this, right? The reworking of Indian concepts and architecture, amalgamation of local ideas. Now what if we looked at Aksara? Just a quick kind of context. Huh? So when I say um, 
uh, regions of Malay speakers. Actually, we left out one area of Malay speakers, and that is coastal Borneo, because that's also the homeland of Malay speakers. And so in these areas, you also have the Yupa inscriptions of Kutai, um, which if you listen to Jean Baptiste, you will find out from him that he says, that on the script, there is no direct Indian model that corresponds to it, as the script had already evolved from its Indian predecessors. This is 4th century. This would be slightly earlier than the earliest temples of Kedah. Yeah. So Kutai is a Malay-speaking region of coastal Borneo, facing Sulawesi. Okay. And um, other examples from around coastal Borneo. Now, if those of us who are interested in Malay linguistic history, you, you will also know about the hypothesis that Malay as a language would have come from Borneo. Coastal Borneo is the homeland of Malay. So this is of interest from that perspective as well. So uh, Batu Pahat, not our Batu Pahat in uh, Johor, but the Batu Pahat here, now the name, why is it called Batu Pahat? Maybe there is a Batu Pahat, you know, inscribed stone in Johor. Who knows? Why is it called Batu Pahat? Or maybe they just worked stone. But this Batu Pahat refers to this Batu Yang Dipahat, inscribed stone, um, depicting seven stupas and Sanskrit verses, including what have been called mystery verses. They're no longer, they're not mystery at all. So, uh, so skilling uh, has managed to kind of transcribe most of them. They refer to the names of different, different Buddhas. But um, a, where was I on this? Yes, this artifact, if you read Peter Skilling, um, is another uh, motif of multiple tiered stupas with no Indian precedent, and there is a distribution all the way to uh, Kedah as well. Yeah, so it's part of this Southeast Asian island, Southeast Asia, and uh, distribution of shared motifs that are not found in India but found here in island Southeast Asia. Um, this is the example from the Bujang Valley in Kedah and Sungai Mas in Kedah, the top has been obliterated. Other examples uh, of pre, um, artifacts um, that have no uh, clear Indian precedent. Both are Buddhist inscriptions. So I, won't, I won't have time to go through them, but I want to point out this, um, this very interesting uh, case. So there is a Buddhist mantra formula found on this particular inscription, the Prasasti Sungai Mas number two. Yeah. And if John Gee, who was writing in 2014, referred to Skilling, whose article appears here. So at that time, because he wrote in 2014, he says forthcoming, it's not coming out yet. Saying that this sutra, this sutra belongs to the Madhyamika sect, he says. And then he notes that it's found across Southeast Asia. But if you listen to Skilling when he published a year later, Skilling contradicts this. He says it doesn't come from that. It says, this verse is not known from any Indian inscription and it is yet to be traced in any Indian Buddhist text, whether in the original Indic language or in Tibetan or Chinese translation. What does that tell us? Huh? That means this is unique. We don't know where it comes from. So then there are forms of um, other forms of uh, you know, uh, puzzles. So this early uh, Chiratun boulder from the 5th century of West Java, uh, what's famous about it, uh, some of these uh, floral scripts, but also the uh, ancestors of the, or rather predecessors of the ruler who had a Sanskrit name, Purnavarman, had a father, Pinabahu, and then an unnamed grandfather was involved. So Pinabahu is not Sanskrit. Yeah, it's not a Sanskrit name. So he refers to a, 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 a father whose name is not Sanskrit. Um, where was I on this? I was going to mention something else in relation to this, and I forgot. Um, never mind. Oh, yes, that, that um, many other innovations uh, connected to Southeast Asia appear to have been lost because, for example, in 671 AD, a Chinese uh, um, traveler noted that he collected a Chinese general collected in Champa, uh, how many thousand, I forgot the exact number, uh, Buddhist manuscripts written in the language of the, what they called Kunlun. Kunlun was the Chinese term for Malay-speaking peoples of the Straits of Malacca. So re they refer to Sriwijaya and all these places as Kunlun peoples and the Kunlun Cho. So in other words, Kunlun was the Chinese name or term for Malay speakers. And they claim that in Champa, they collected a few hundred, a few thousand Buddhist in, uh, manuscripts, not inscriptions, in Kunlun language. This is reported by Sarkar in his, in his work. 
So there are all these things. We don't, we don't, unlike Javanese, so in Javanese, old Javanese manuscripts, we have quite a large corpus of texts on Buddhism. Yeah? But uh, we don't have a single text in old Malay on Buddhism. We've lost not even us. Maybe we'll find it one day. You know, recently they found, you know how they found Nagara Kartagama was accidentally in Lombok. Somebody kept it. Not on Java itself, but in Lombok. And how they found the Tanjung Tana manuscript, the recently discovered 14th century Malay manuscript written in Kawi script. On, uh, so, so that was also discovered by accident in Highland Rajang. So, you know, we, we don't know what manuscript is still hiding, hiding somewhere, you know, hidden somewhere. Um, I'm going to just zoom to this. Uh, so this... It's another puzzle for those of us who come from Singapore. And this is one of our great losses. Because Singapore would have been, you know, if you, if you trust the Sulala to Salatin, it says that Malacca was founded via Singapore. Now, whether it was via Singapore through five generations or just one usurper who fled Singapore after having done some killing there, whichever is the case, if we take it to be true, then there is some connection via Singapore. Right? And that memory seems to hold true in the fact that you have this. Of course, the dating is disputed, huh? It used to be assumed that this is 14th century, but some are now saying it could be 10, could be 12. We don't know for sure yet because the whole thing has not been entirely transcribed. It exists only in three fragments. You know why it was destroyed. The British military engineers decided to blast the whole stone because they needed to build a fort there, Fort Fullerton. So next time you come to Singapore, right there where Fullerton Hotel is, that used to be the site of this Singapore stone. They blasted it away. Now we'll never know. But also you get the Majapahit Javanese-style uh, gold jewellery from Fort Canning. This one was discovered in 1928. So there are a number of these uh, other puzzles uh, in, in terms of um, for Singapore, for example. Uh, and we don't have uh, uh, any inscriptions uh, of that nature yet found on the peninsula. So let's go to the last bit. I mentioned quite a number of times the memory encapsulated about this pre-Islamic period in the, let's just use the simple name, uh, Sejarah Melayu. It's not actually a real name, it's Salatu Salatin. Um, so in the Sejarah Melayu, there is this interesting um, reference that says that the origin of this ruler who appeared, appeared miraculously on Bukit Seguntang came from Palembang. And then there is suddenly this reference to Moratatang. It's very strange. Like, why do you suddenly mention Moratatang? And then it says, if you go to the upper, the headwaters of Moratatang, there is another river called Malayu. Where, 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 why is it suddenly saying all this? Now, what if I told you, only in 1920 did we rediscover this bolder inscription from Sungai Tatang. But the Sulalatu Salatin recorded this name. Moratatang, out of the blue, nobody understands why. It just says, you know, oh, there's this river Moratatang in Palembang, and then if you go up, you'll find Melayu River. Just like that, it just says that. And then it refers to um, also the fact that uh, you have, and, and sorry, the fact that you can go to Sungai Melayu, right? And so this is the inscription that says that the ruler boarded a ship on a quest to seek Siddhayatra and then uh, had an army right, uh, to, to go to Malayu. Um, and so that, that's, that's very strange because, not strange, it's very, very interesting how the Salaratu Salatin recorded that. And of course, the reference to Bukit Seguntang is where we find uh, this inscription on the Parallax etc. that I mentioned earlier. So it seems that the, the, the Salaratu Salatin at least in those two references, seem to embody some kind of knowledge that we only rediscovered much later. Because I want to emphasize the fact that before this was rediscovered in 1920 and the other one in 1928, we had no idea these inscriptions existed. When Sulalatu Salatin was written in the 16th century, the Malays had lost a direct personal connection to Palembang. But they seem to have retained that memory of uh, this landscape between Jambi and Palembang. And then, of course, uh, I, I just wanted to point out that uh, there's this neglected, because we are referring to the straits, huh? we neglect the other side, but the other side has a different story to tell. So if you are quite familiar with the Tranganu stone, uh, you can contextualize it in cultural history. I put this red uh, coloring here to show that it, Tranganu and Kolabrang right there 
would have been just beyond the supposed reach of Majapahit. And yet, if you read M.B. Hooker in J.M. Brass in 1976 in her article, she talks about how this text, besides having the fascinating term Dewata Mulia Raya to refer to God for an Islamic legal text, you know, it refers to God as Dewata Mulia Raya. Dewata and Mulia are Sanskrit, Raya is Malay. That's really interesting. It, I mean, it uses Arabic script. It could have just written Allah. But instead of writing Allah, much ink was spilled. Okay, it wasn't ink, but they had to carve more letters just to say Dewata Mulia Raya instead of Allah. And it's, in, it's using Arabic script in Malay though. So it's quite interesting that I'm talking here, of course, about the translation and transition yeah, from Indic to Islamic. So Dewata Mulia Raya seems to refer to some Indic usage, Indic era usage. Um, but, and also that, that it has parallels in Javanese law texts and codes, even though it's Islamic. And so, uh, Hooker refers to this uh, Southeast Asian shared uh, legal um, corpus. And uh, I wanted to also contextualize, so we've looked at Kuala Barang, we're going to look at a few Pengkalan uh, Kempas, Malacca, as well as Pasai. So, I mean, if you placed it in the constellation of Indic sites we, referred, we have referred to so far. They're all very close neighbours. But from these other sites, if you look at this mapping, it's quite interesting because they all seem to be different uh, area of focus, right, from the southern region. But in these other areas, you get the evidence of that transition. We've already looked at this. Yeah? So uh, Pasai and Aceh are quite interesting to look at as kind of transitional pivots. This is from Pasai. And you have another example from uh, Malacca, Pengkalan Kempas. Actually, it's already kind of like beyond Malacca, but it's very close to Malacca. Now, what's interesting about both of these are that they use both Arabic and Kawi script on Islamic tombstones. So there was a period of time when the literacy in these two writing scripts overlapped. Some of you might already know this, but this is something that I think we kind of don't think about that much. There was that period of time, it would have been fascinating to time travel back then, you know. This is 1380, 1389. There's a discrepancy in the date which puzzles everybody. In the um, Kawi side, the date is given as 1380. It's given in Hijriya, even though it's written in Kawi, it's, the date is in Hijriya, not in uh, Shaka. And then um, on the Arabic side, it's given as 79, the equivalent of 791. Um, the Ahmad Majan one, you can just about make up. This is Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And if you only know Jawi or Arabic, the rest you cannot read because it's in Kawi, right? So likewise, uh, this is the Bismillah, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, and then the rest of it is in Kawi. So it coexists on this stone. That, would, that is nothing compared to Majapahit. So Majapahit has Islamic gravestones that use Shaka era in the Javanese numerals. This is 1376 AD, I mean the equivalent. This is 1407, they're all dated. In some cases, this is also Javanese numerals, this is Arabic script. Yeah? And then they use the Kalamakara motif. Now, Kalamakara motif is also found on this one. So, this one has the Majapahit uh, royal sunburst motif and the image of a scroll, a writing scroll. Um, so, so there is, this is the context, the Majapahit capital. So, in fact, Majapahit round about the time of the, now, these are all 1360s and so on, eh? the same period as uh, this one, which is 1380, 1389. So if you look at that period of time, just before the foundation of Malacca and then after it, this is after, of course, this is 1463, 1467, at the height of Malacca's uh, sultanate period, right? the height of its uh, power. Uh, this one coincides with that, Sultan Mansur Shah's reign. So this was the environment in which uh, the transition from uh, from uh, the Indic to the Islamic took place. Other examples which I'll just breeze through, these are all in existence during the time of the Malacca Sultanate in Pasai. Do you remember there is an episode in the Sulalatu Salatin that said that there was a question on religion and this was referred to, to Pasai. Yeah, Pasai was acknowledged as, a, as an important center for scholarship. What is interesting is Pasai came up with this fantastic tradition of Islamic gravestones that persist, that continues into the, the 18th and 19th centuries, Batu Aceh. So if you were a person of royal blood, then your gravestones would be imported from there. You have imports of Batu Aceh uh, in non-Malay speaking context in, in Makassar. So Makassari's rulers imported 
Batu Aceh for their royal gravestones. And uh, Banten. Banten is in West Java. But the rest of Java does not use Batu Aceh. Only Banten in West Java. But what is interesting about this is that it uses motifs derived from, yeah, you guessed it, Chandi. This is a Javanese Chandi profile. Pasai is so far away from Java though. However, in 1360, 1360s, Pasai was conquered by Java. So the oldest known text in classical Malay, now Pasai people are not native Malay speakers, they speak Achenese, which is very different. They don't call Sungai Sungai, they call it Kerang. It's very different. But because of the use of Malay as lingua franca, the Hikayat Raja Raja Pasai was written in classical Malay in the Jawi script. And the close of the Hikayat speaks of the invasion of Anjapahit. It's very fascinating. And of course, you have the puzzle of the, not puzzle, but the interesting form of the Batu Aceh, this one as well. Right? It's shaped like a chandi, with, even with the, with the, the plinth. Yeah. So these take, of course, they're not exactly the same as chandi. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that at all. But what I'm saying is that the idea of a gravestone could have been just easily borrowed from somewhere in the Islamic West, could have been from India. I mean, we could have just done that. But instead of that, the Pasai artisans conceived of their own tradition in stone, stoneworking, of course, and then came out with these kinds of profiles with plinths and antifixes at the corners. And um, in the case of the mosque of Palopo in Lu, you even have the form of a stone construction that you use, you find on Chandi. Now, I want to point this out because when the Portuguese conquered Malacca in 1511 and dismantled the mosque of Malacca, the private secretary, and I wrote about this in a small little newsletter um, for Malacca uh, back in, was it 2005, 2009? I, I took out this obscure factoid which people seem to have overlooked. The Portuguese noted, they recorded that the royal mosque of Malacca was built of stone cubes like this, obviously. And it was very difficult to dismantle, they said. And you know what they used the stones for? The thing that we are so proud of about Malacca now, la, are from, um, the, 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 fortifi the Portuguese fortifications. So they reused the stones from the royal mosque of Malacca as well as the Muslim tombs, including, and you can go to the National Mu Museum here in Kuala Lumpur and see the hewn gravestone of, I forgot which, Malacca Sultan, which the Portuguese had squared off and used for their fortification. It was rediscovered. And then now we have it as an artifact in the National Museum. I forget suddenly the name of the Sultan. One of the Sultans of Malacca's actual tombstone, Batu Aceh. Batu Aceh. It was cut off. You know, Batu Aceh have these uh, impractical shapes, right? So to make it a practical building block, you cut off lah, and then you use it. So uh, what I'm saying is that there is these continuities, eh? whether in motifs or in uh, building um, fabric, this, the actual fabric. And in this case, now, Sokotunggal, I'll come back. There's a central spine, a central column. I'll come back to that. But this, um, this is a Kalamakara format with wings at the side. And there are so many examples of this in sites across Java of winged gateways that seem to have only been created in the Islamic period. In the previous Buddhist period of Javanese history and Hindu period of Javanese history, the winged gate did not seem to have appeared. So there are many other cases like this. The wings, as well as this Kala Makara. But this is in uh, Palopo Luwu. I must explain the connection. The proselytizer who converted people in uh, Luwu to Islam are said to be Minangkabau. And so Minangkabau mosques are characterized by this central column. It's very interesting from that perspective. It seems to signal the fact that this is really connected to Minangkabau. Not the four columns, but one single column. But then it has this. Now, that the Minangkabau did not use this motif. So then the craftsman for the Minba must have been from somewhere else. And it, it, probably because of the construction, it could have been Javanese. Because they could have been Javanese. Eh? So Javanese could have been involved, Javanese craftsmen at least, in some way in Pasai, either because of the connection prior to the conquest or after, but also in the case of uh, the construction of, say, the Palupo Mosque right here, and probably also in Malacca. We don't know. Because 
Malacca built in stone blocks, not in red brick. So if you remember, most of the sites on Sumatra used red brick, not stone blocks. Stone blocks was a Javanese uh, building technology. I have to conclude now, so let me just move forward. This is all examples of Kalamakara, in case you're wondering. So the Kalamakara, of, of course, is greatly, uh, uh, what do you call this? Greatly uh, simplified, right, for the use on, uh, this is on Bhutan. In South Sulawesi, they have a kind of, a, what would you call it, a tradition that says that the people who converted uh, Bhutan are sh some Sharif person, I mean some Hadrami Arab from Johor. That's what they say. But then they have this interesting Kalamakara format for the uh, mimbar. And here's the mihrab niche uh, in Chirabon. So I was talking about how Chirabon also has all of these motifs of, um, I'm not showing you the winged gates, but this one is a one-eyed kala with a makara. So it's so highly stylized in this case, it's no longer looking like Kalamakara. But that's the motif right there, with lotus capitals. Yeah. And the kinds of endless knot motif that you find in late Majapahit era um, ornaments. For the Malayan Peninsula, you have uh, artifacts such as this. Some scholars like Rosnawati Othman have tried to talk about um, uh, this as the Langkasukan motif because they want to give it a name. Uh, but this particular floral arrangement with very precise geometric calculations uh, also take after the form of the... This one is actually what would be called the Kijang. Um, uh, I mean, it's Kijang in Malay, but it, it's uh, Kalamarga. So not Kalamakara, but Kalamarga. This is a Kala head right there. Can you? I don't know whether you can see it, but see, Kala heads look like that. Eh? So by the time you get to the Langkasukan, the so-called Langkasukan motif, you have an abstraction of the Kala head face right there. That's the, that's the tongue right there. And then out of which comes the Marga. Not, not the Makara, but the Marga, which are Kijang. At the side. This is an alternative. So I will spend too much time going back, but just now from um, Majapahit, the Trowulan Muslim graves have the Kalamarga as well, the frame. So this is a Kalamarga in Malay tradition, as opposed to the Kalamarga in Javanese tradition. Yeah, Malay wood carving tradition, uh, in this case, deals with the floriation and abstraction slightly differently, but this is undisputably a Kalamakara. That's really fascinating. Kalamakara being used for gravestone. Well, without having to explain, you know this is a Kalamakara, just highly stylized. And very interestingly, the body leaf is used as a kind of rondelle for the... I can't, I can't really read it. Is it the Basmana? I, can't, I have to look at it properly. I forgot what it is. Yeah, that is an Arabic uh, formula right there. So these are ways in which... For architecture as well, you know, all of this now, this is interesting because it's actually called the finial. These are the finials. Eh? This is the original Sultan Mosque in Singapore. The finial is originally called the Mamolo, which is a, I suppose, corrupted, you can say, form of the term Brahmamula. Brahmamula, the receptacle of the elixir of immortality, which would have been guarded by four Nagas on the roof. So in fact, these were conceived as the Nagas that protected the Brahmamula or Mamolo. Yeah. So this actually, but of course when it's used on mosques, it's only symbolic. But it refers to, um, so a whole plethora of these. Now of course, by the time you get to the Islamic period, these become Sulur Bayung. When originally they would have signified the, the Naga. I mean, there are so many different kinds of uh, uh, survivals, if you like, of this older pavilion form that you don't really see when you look at Chandi architecture, but when you look at the carved reliefs on the Chandi, then you get these forms, some of which have four columns, some have a single central column, and the single central column is what is more typically found on Minangkabau mosques. You find it on Javanese examples, and uh, you know, in the Javanese examples, you have four columns, but sometimes the four columns may, can be at the summit with this uh, miniature tiers of a single central column. So there's a whole variety of, of uh, tiered roof forms that existed in the Indic period. Now, I'm not suggesting though that these forms are Buddhist, but they are used, or rather they, they, they refer to certain ideas that seem to have been manifested from Buddhist ideas, like the Brahmamula, but not in ways that were seen in India itself. So you cannot find a finial that represents the Brahmamula in Indian architecture. 
So you get what I'm saying? So it's, it's Javanese Buddhist, in other words. There's no such thing as a Brahma Mula Finil in India for Buddhism or Hinduism for that matter. It's not, it's not present. So that was something invented by the Malays and Javanese themselves to refer to this Indic conception. Right? You, you, you get what I'm saying? So it's actually not found like that. Um, and of course, the, the, the form itself can be used for different religions. So, for example, in um, Balinese Hinduism, in this case, an example in Lombok, so there are Balinese Hindus in Lombok, 11 tiers represent Shiva, 9 tiers represent Vishnu. Uh, it could also be without representing any deity, it's just a pavilion. But for mosques, it's usually five or three tiers. Yeah? So, mosques use the same building form. This is, sorry, I'm using HDB because I present this in Singapore and I, I can have a convenient reference, right? 26-story HDB block, that's the height of this Limo Kau Mosque in Minangkabau. Of course, conveniently, um, Latif Mohidin is Minangkabau, so, I mean, this is a kind of, um, the, the kind of mosques with a central column in Minangkabau, yeah? whereas the Javanese examples don't have a central column, they have four uh, principal columns. So, they have often been, the, the roof form has often been compared to the Maru Towers or the Wantilan, but actually mosque architecture's structural configuration is quite different, it's quite distinct uh, from, um, from these other forms. Sorry, these other forms. So I think I will have to conclude using the Malacca examples to take us back here. So in other words, if we were to read uh, these forms yeah, for the mosque, very often I've heard it being understood as Chinese, without understanding that the typological form of this is actually not Chinese at all. The ornaments are not. However, if you look very carefully, there is a Chinese swallowtail motif up here, right? And that's because of the uh, involvement of Chinese builders to renovate the mosque. And so it seems that the Chinese builders then used the swallowtail motif up here and then put the sulur bayong at the end. So there's a sulur bayong at the end of the roof, but two -thirds of the way, one third of the way up, you have a Chinese swallowtail motif, so it's got both. It's rather interesting. And I thought I want to end on this note because if you talk about uh, this being a reference to some Buddhist mytholo mythology, uh, then if I were to refer to the fact that Chinese renovated it, today most people might misunderstand it already, right? It's like, oh, Buddhist, Chinese, oh, that means must be added by them. I hope that this talk has kind of pointed out the fact that there are so many layers from the, the, Buddhi the long Buddhist history of the Malay region, which, you know, sometimes it might be staring at us in the face, uh, but we don't understand it. This pagoda-like thing looks like a Chinese pagoda, doesn't it? It's another source of confusion, so I'm going to use this to end. This is, in fact, derived from the Chulia minaret from southern India, whereas this is derived from the Hadrami minaret of southern Arabia. Most of the Arabs in our region are Hadramaut, Hadramaut Arabs, Hadrami. But they look somewhat similar, but they are quite different. So this one articulates these lamp niches. Niches for lamps. This one does not. Eh? But both of them have a pavilion at the top. And then you have an intermediate form like that, which seems to have enlarged the niches into what seem to be proper windows. Yeah? And always they will have the Momolo and the Sulur Bayung. Yeah, this one has a rather badly done Momolo and no Sulur Bayung. This one has the complete set. So what we are looking at here is a tradition that in Singapore is even worse because this particular minaret looks more like a church steeple than anything else. I think it's an attempt that went wrong. The, the person who commissioned it though was a Hadrami Arab. So Hadramaut um, uh, minarets look like that, quite close to the Kampung Hulu one. Yeah, um, like this. Eh? So Hadramaut and then uh, the Malacca one, which is trying to actually, now this is the Hadramaut example, and then these are Chulia examples. Yeah? So if you go to Nagor Darga, actual Nagor Darga in uh, India, then you will see these huge minarets, like this, but they are really big, um, in this form with the lamp niches that I was talking about. And so if you understood that, these lamp niche minarets with reticulated Hours. Then you look at the Kampung Keling, which has Chulias. Chulias are Tamil Muslims. Look at this minaret in a new light, because this is a wonderful hybrid example to finish the talk with. It is actually in typological form a Chulia minaret. 
such as you can see in the Nagor Dargah in Nargo, Nagor, Tamil Nadu. But it has a pavilion at the top which does not exist in the uh, Nagor uh, precedent. And more importantly, it is kept, it is a roofed pavilion. That's what it's trying to be up here with the Mamolo and the Sulur Bayung. So that makes this a truly cosmopolitan hybrid building in Malacca. So I think I'll end it right there. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Imran. We now have time for a 15-minute Q&A session. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can raise your hand. I'll pass you the mic. Hi, uh, Imran. Sorry, Hi. question here. Um, I'm quite curious about, you, you, sh you showed some slides about some chandis uh, in the beginning that had no stupas on them. They had like um, pago pagos that were missing. Um, I'm just wondering, because I'm quite curious why they have been cut off so cleanly and that all the stupas are, are missing. Could they have been, I'm, I'm just wondering because, yeah, I, I was thinking that it could be that the, the, the construction of the stupas had a void inside for the sunyata, but you said that that had no precedence other than the ones in Borobudur, which was empty, in, uh, that is a hollow. Um, or could they have been made of ephemeral materials? So, yeah. Uh, for, for me to answer this properly, we would have to have photos of the archaeological ruins as they were found. What I suspect is that when they were discovered, uh, they were in a state of ruin where you, you, it would have looked like the kind of ruins we see in Kedah sometimes, you know, fallen into disarray. So I think when they reconstructed it, so what you see today is actually the result of reconstruction by archaeologists, some of which are disputed. Like I mentioned, I gave one example where Sukmono disputed the reconstruction of Chandi Gumpung in Morajambi. Uh, but we're not looking at Chandi Gumpung, we're looking at Chandi Bungsu, right? So that one, uh, no, Chandi Tinggi. So, um, for that one, I don't know whether I should go back to the slide. Uh, the reconstruction stopped at the level of the terraces. That's what I can say. So they didn't try to reconstruct the stupas. Yeah, but based on the, the way things are constructed around the, the, those particular locations on the terraces, we know that there used to be stupas there. But uh, for some reason, they have not restored the stupas. Yeah. I thought you were going to ask whether somebody desecrated it. Okay. Yeah. Does that mean the stones for stupa are still around, just not built? Should be. It's the same with, yeah. It, that, that means they, you, they would have, uh, there would have been some round, uh, or rather uh, bricks that allow you to build the round profile of the stupa. Yeah. Um, the same with uh, the Panataran temple. We only have the bases. They have not built all the actual temple bodies that would have stood on the bases. They actually reconstructed the temple body elsewhere. I don't know how they're going to build. I mean, they, they kind of did a trial reconstruction at the site. Oh, the other thing is, of course, to say that um, the dispute now in archaeology, and I'm not an archaeologist, this is what I know, is that, uh, but I know this for sure. The, the dispute now is that it used to be in the past that uh, there was always this impulse to rebuild as much as you can so that at least you can see it again. But today, people are more careful. So if you're not very 100% sure, you wouldn't rebuild it. Uh, you would do some trials. There are not enough bricks, then don't proceed. But you know there's a stupa, at least you know that used to be like that. But you wouldn't actually build it again. Bagan has taken the completely different approach in, in Myanmar, right? Many of the Bagan temples are completely reconstructed. We're not really sure how much of it is you know, actually correct. So from the point of view of history, architectural history, this is very bad because we will never know. You've already kind of destroyed the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, regarding the last part and the transition to Islam, I would like to know, do, do you think that uh, the, the architects, or maybe not for Malacca, but the architect, arch architects and the uh, which one? Um, yeah, the crafts done for the tombs. Um, do you think the oh. architects uh, wanted to actually take inspiration from the uh, previous uh, Buddhist and Hinduist uh, arts, 
or do you believe that it was the architects wanted to combine uh, the new concept of Islam with what was <laughs> done previously with Buddhism to make the people to convert more easily to Islam? My question is clear or...? <laughs> yes, it's very clear. In fact, <laughs> okay, I'm like, okay, you. wow, I'm smiling because you're connecting to... Yeah, okay. The point here is, in Java, a lot of the argument about how the, you know, the famous uh, Muslim proselytizers there, who are collectively called Wali Songo, right? The argument is that the Wali Songo deliberately used culture as a strategy. So, for example, gamelan is used to attract conversion, wayang kulit. You know, you even have a whole repertoire of Islamic wayang kulit tales. Uh, Amir Hamza, particularly. Uh, and then, uh, where, where was I going on this? So, yes, uh, but we don't have the same evidence uh, for Malacca or for the Malaya, Malay, Malayan and Sumatran uh, Malay-speaking regions. Uh, but there is a connection between the, some of the Wali Songo figures in their biographies and travelling to Malacca. They did mention that, so I don't know. But, but your, your question brings us to another point, which is, actually, I forgot to mention. In terms of chronology, these mosques in Malacca and their use of the Momolo and the Sulur Bayung is a chronological enigma. Why do I say that? These mosques were only built late in the Dutch period. Because in the Portuguese period, you want to die, you build mosques, right? There was no mosque allowed in the Portuguese period. The Dutch period, late Dutch period, well, mid, I suppose, the 18th century, yes. Though there seems to be some evidence that in the late 1600s, there was at least one mosque already. Um, so around about 1600s and 1700s, only then do you get these mosques being built in Malacca. My question to myself when I wrote this, I have another article which I didn't um, mention and that focused specifically on this last part. Uh, but in that article, I didn't talk about this strange continuity of these motifs. My question to myself would be, where, how, did this tradition con how did this tradition continue in Malacca like that? How did the people of Malacca know how to build the Momolo and the Sulur Bayong? Who were the craftsmen involved? How come the Malacca people could do this? because it's so disconnected with everything else, you know? Just suddenly, in the 1600s and 1700s, Malacca Muslims built mosques, and then you have this Momolo and the Sulur Bayong repair. Mind you, this is 1600s. The last time any Malay in Malacca would have built their own mosque like that would have been when the Portuguese conquered them. Unless there would have been mosques built in the outlying regions we don't know of in wood that could have used this. The tradition, interestingly, these stucco objects, so I'm not really going yet to your question about whether this was for conversion, but I'm talking here about the question of architectural tradition continuity. How did this tradition and the idea and the crafting continue? These were built apparently using coral. So the Malaccan Malays knew how to build this themselves. They collected coral, they boiled it, they mixed it with lime and plaster, and then they, they sculpt this thing. They're huge, you know, if you took it down, it's this big. It's a big thing. And then they have these rules about how to compose it, and then they put it on. Can you just imagine? I mean, who, who should we interview about these things? I've often wondered. I, unfortunately, I, I know the answer is nobody because the people who built these things have all passed away. So I'm just wondering how Malacan Malays preserved this tradition of building Momolo and Sulur Bayung. I don't know whether... That didn't really answer your question. Whether they thought of it as trying to melt Buddhism, and, no, I don't think so. I think it's more the tradition, the continuity of tradition. Yeah, and the, sim the, meaning about, uh, the meaning behind such symbols. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Okay, well, thank you for your time, and thank you to everyone again, if you can give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.